Hello again, everybody. My name is John D. Healy. I do a podcast. It's called It's Good to Talk. I'm a curious good to talk. I always do have interesting guests on. Today is no exception. People know me because I produced this book for my friend Stoney McGurn. It's his life story from 1941 up until recently. True stories, a lot of Irish stuff in it, but then a lot of New York stuff in it. Down south during the civil rights and all that. Sponsors are Liffey Van Lines, a company here in New York City, and they've been around longer than New York City Marathon. Jimmy will be on to sing a song again at the end of this podcast. Jimmy Grady. So wait until the end of the podcast to get Jimmy, because we don't want to upset Jimmy. He's a good singer. Actually, he's going to be singing a song today for Liffey. Can you believe that? I tell you, yes. My other people I give a shout out to is the Irish Examiner USA. It's a great Irish American newspaper here in New York City, not just New York City, all over the United States. That gives you all the latest news in arts, music, and events and history all over New York, but outside as well. We do get news from across the pond keeping us up to date with everything going on with the uh, United Ireland, which I have my shoulder to the wheel on that one. A new venue I found lately is Hendrickson's Bar on 61st Street on 1st Avenue. I enjoy my time off there for trivia sometimes, bingo sometimes, pint of Guinness always, and good food. So let me move right on to my guest today, uh, Emmett O'Malley. Emmett, you're very welcome to the show, and it's good to have an O'Malley on here. Welcome. Hey, thanks. Good to be here. Okay, so I'm going to give you a couple of famous O'Malley's I know. Well, I know a lot of O'Malley's, but in Irish folklore and Irish history, Grace O'Malley was a famous Irish pirate. She was the only woman ever, I think, in the world to be known as a pirate. But she was pretty feisty, to say the least. There's a statue of her in Westport House in Westport County, Mayo, beautiful town to go to. And the other O'Malley's I'm familiar with would be Des O'Malley, Desmond O'Malley, who set up the PDs, the Progressive Democratic Party, with a good friend of mine, Mary Harney, and they set it up in back in the 90s. So, Emmett, let's get to you. I want to know your story, where you were born, of course, and how you got to where you are and what you're doing. Yeah, I was born in Corvallis, Oregon, which is a bit of a uh, bit of a departure from where my parents are from. But um, so my I guess I'll do a little family history here too. But so my parents met in uh, Boston, Massachusetts, where my dad was born. His parents had emigrated from Ireland, both from County <laughs> Galway. But yeah, so both my parents were educators. My dad taught in public schools for almost two decades and then was an instructor in the education department at Oregon State University, uh, where my mom worked as well. So I was born in Corvallis, born and raised there. And yeah, my dad had an Irish passport. I was very proud of that fact. Tried to stay really connected to that part of himself. Married a nice Jewish girl and moved out to Oregon. So then I kind of was raised simultaneously having this sort of like my dad's Boston Irish identity with my mom's much more nomadic identity. And then I was from this rural place in Oregon. So yeah. And then, well, I guess you go, you go, you go. I think you said your dad came from Galway, but was it like the Connemara in Galway? Yeah, so my grandfather's from Connemara. Uh, he was born in Alibrack and grew up in Clifton, and my grandmother's from Spittle. Well, I'm very familiar with Spittle because when I had my restaurant in Ireland, Mother Hubbard's in County Kildare, which is in the centre of Ireland, for those of you that are not familiar with Ireland, I did sponsor 10 scholarships to uh, the Gales Duck in Spittle for students that didn't know how to speak Irish for the summertime. And that was Colosh to Dara, and the chap in charge of that was Paul O'Fweel, and that was in 19, actually January 94. And Michael D. Higgins presented the applicants that got the scholarships. He spoke Australia, of course, even though the kids hadn't learned their Irish yet. That was just a small snafu because Michael D. Higgins can be a bit dreamy. So continue on. So your grandfather born in Connemara and you have a combination of Spittle and Connemara itself, which is all about. Tell me more about your background. Yeah. So I grew up in Oregon and I went to, I ended up going to prep school in Massachusetts. I was really into sports, played basketball and baseball mainly, ran cross country as well. And then I went from that prep school called the Willis Northampton School to uh, Vassar College in Poughkeepsie, New York. I studied political science and philosophy. And then from there, I graduated. I worked at a policy think tank based out of uh, Columbia Law School and UCLA Law School. Did that for a few years. And then the sad curveball here is that my dad passed away suddenly in July of 2020. He was 63. And when that happened, at the time, I was splitting time between New York and Los Angeles. But I moved home to be with my mom and sister. What, were you doing? what type of work were you doing at the time? Yeah, so I was, uh, right, I worked, I was the, I think my official title was the, uh, I was a deputy director. And then I focused on the writing side of things at the policy forum. It was called the African American Policy Forum. It was a progressive think tank. I worked alongside a woman named Kimberly Crenshaw and did a lot of assistant work, did a lot of writing work. Yeah, it was a busy, it was a busy job. But yeah, and I think, you know, when my dad passed, it was too much, too much to continue doing. Yeah. Fair enough. So, so I, I also, I think I'd done a lot of writing on behalf of other people in that position. And when my dad passed, I was like, you know what? I want to do my own writing. And so since he passed, I've been working on my own book 
which has gone through several iterations now. And I like to think I'm toward the yeah. later stages, complete manuscript on. But yes, yeah, so that's what I've been last for a couple of years. And that's what well, I think it's led really, me I, into I you for, you. Yeah, I commend you for getting started on writing a book. Because when I wrote the book for my friend Stoney here, it certainly, I found, well, you know, it took a couple of years with research. And, you know, he's a storyteller. So we would keep adding stories to it. But I... What I noticed with him was it was very good therapy to get everything out of the system onto paper, you know? So it was therapy for him. And when I finished doing the editing and formatting, it's like I needed a therapist just to deal with that in a jovial sense, of course, I'm saying. So tell me a little bit more about your writing. Where are you at? Do you need a story with a beginning, yeah. a middle, an end? Yeah. So when my dad first died, my kind of I kept a blog that was kind of I just wanted to be kind of a tribute to him. I wrote a lot about his life and a lot about the I wrote a lot about the experience of losing him. And I was posting on it every day. And I think it was to, to some of what you said, like it was kind of a desperate attempt at making sense of a, of a difficult situation. At some point, I think I realized that I wanted to write something bigger. And the initial idea was I'd write a big novel based on his life. Because, you know, I thought I learned a lot about him after he passed too, about kind of how he ended up going from being a working class a kid in Irish Boston to being a college professor in rural Oregon. It's kind of a quite a journey to take. And I was going to, so, so for the first several months after he passed, or after the first month, I kept the blog. And then thereafter, I tried working on this uh, big novel about his life. And I really struggled with it, to your point, about the difficulty. I think there were some good stories. I think the shape of it was tough. And I think I was just also struggling a lot mentally. So I started driving a school bus uh, just to sort of get some structure back in my life. And so I'd drive the bus from six to nine, elementary and middle school students. And then I'd write from nine to two. Then I'd drive the bus from two to five. And then I'd play basketball at night. And uh, during that time, I kept working on this big dad novel and kept getting frustrated by it. And at one point, about a year into that process, I was like, you know what? I'm going to try writing a short story about the bus because it seems like there's a lot there. Yeah, good. So I did that. And that short story has sort of led to what exists now, which is an autobiographical novel centered around my experience driving the bus in the year after my dad died, but interspersing sort of various reckonings, reckoning with my relationship with my dad, um, right. telling stories of his life and our relationship and reckoning with right. what it meant to lose him and kind of the professional fallout that uh, right. amounted from it. So yeah, I think that that's a bit of a gloss on it. Um I have, in terms of where I'm at with it most specifically, I hired an editor a couple months ago to go through the first 200 pages that I felt like had a real good shape um, that I think make yeah. up, yeah, that I think make up kind of part one of the book. And I think now I'm working on part two, which is not ironically, I guess, but maybe unsurprisingly sort of circling back to specifically my relationship so, with my dad. My guest so. today is Jim O'Malley. Podcast is called Good Talk. And so the first part of the book, that first part one, does that have an ending? I think, yes. So it's sort of a literary idea that I like is that the more direct direct a plot line is, the more room there is for the author to sort of wander along, take tangents, because there's this rudder of a uh, structure. And part one is a day on the bus, and it ends with me with the day ending. Yeah. And so I want that to be sort of the arc of part one. It's just kind of what it meant to work through this one day in the immediate aftermath of my dad passing and the memories that it evoked of our relationship and how working with young people, being around children while losing my father in a surprising way when I was, I was 23 was I could make sense of it on the bus a little more well, than I could have. The story of, let me try and get a synopsis. The story yeah. of you writing about the, the bus driving, that's like a subplot of a bigger plot. Is that right? Yep. Yeah. It's, and I, you know, it's like rich with symbolism. Yeah. It's sort of, yeah, it, go, it I guess I'm trying to put it in like the simplest way by going through one day on the bus around the kids with the narrator, the bus man, Mr. Busman, having, thinking back on his memories with his father, relating okay. to children, trying to add a lot of humor to it. Yes. But yeah. That's well, important. Important. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you didn't yeah. get a flat wheel there. I'm glad yeah. you didn't get a flat wheel. Okay. Changing a wheel could be a pain in the ass, you know? Yeah, yeah, exactly. It was, I mean, that's the interesting part about it too, is that I think I had to learn a lot about mechanics. Yeah. And like, I think there's something about becoming an expert in something because right. um, it's difficult to become an expert in death or in your relation, in a relationship with a parent, but it's more attainable to become an expert about driving a bus, how a bus works, how to fix it. And I think that's sort of like the idea of work therapy, the idea of sort of having things that keep you going that are attainable goals that can push yeah. you through a difficult day. For right. me, that was the bus. Well, I, I hope, wish you well with the book, and I'll get you back on when you get it to finally published. If you need I help with that, that. you know, because 
So we got our book out and, you know, there's, there's, there's a bit of work and there's a bit of effort in it, but it's well worthwhile in the end because then you have like a solid product of all your own endeavors, and especially if it's connected to your father, who clearly seems to have been very important in your life. Then you have something that's there forever and you're going to share it with the world really and truly. Because like my book is on Amazon. I also put it on audio for people that have problems with their eyesight, with vision problems. That's a good thought you should keep in mind too. Totally. A storyteller, you could do the reading yourself, you know, or you can give it to somebody professional to read the chapters through the book and bring it to the audience that way, you know, because like yep. podcasts and audiobooks are becoming very, very popular in the world we live in now. Because there's so much boring news out there and every all the news stations seem to repeat the news over and over and over and over again. Like, I won't name any news channels because I don't like to knock them because that's not fair. I don't want to be doing dirty laundry while I'm talking to you. So tell me more. Where are you today in your world, in your life? Yeah, I guess, well, just to, I guess, emphasize one thing you just said, there's a line by Ezra Pound that talks about literature as news that stays news. And I think in an era when we kind of just cycle through stories and it's everything's catastrophized and it's kind of an era of distraction, I think trying to create art that is news that stays news is relevant beyond on just the moment, I think is a goal of mine. Anyway, yeah, I live in Harlem. I moved back to New York City in August. Um, I live in East Harlem and I spend my mornings working on writing and reading and I spend my afternoons coaching basketball in Orange, New Jersey. So it's kind of my day-to-day life these days. How did you get to coaching basketball? Yeah, it's pretty random. I mean, basketball has always kind of been my favorite thing, hobby as a fan and as just like, I mean, a recreational player. I played in high school, but not beyond it. But anyway, when I moved back to New York, one of my high school teammates is the uh, lead trainer at a gym in New Jersey called The Clubhouse, which is owned by a pretty famous basketball trainer named Adam Harrington, who works with Kyrie Irving and Kevin Durant and some big names. And so we, when I moved back out here, my friend, my high school friend named Matt, the lead trainer there, asked if I wanted to help out at the gym a little bit. And uh, that's just kind of grown into something I do five days a week and where we train, we train little kids and we train NBA players and we train everything in between. So it's really it's add a lot of uh, energy and joy to my life. That, that's that's excellent. That's good. It's, it's really fun. Your mind, good for your body too, I guess, and good for the soul. Yeah. yeah, good stuff. Now, tell me a little bit more. Do you do you have a title in mind for the book? The book you're writing. Yeah, Mr. Yeah. Busman is the working title. Okay, Mr. All right. Busman. Yeah. All right, well, that's a catchy, catchy name, to say the least. And I guess you'll yeah, put, I hope so. You'll put some kind of uh, artwork on the cover. Like Stoney, my friend, he wrote his book with a pencil. So I insisted on there being a symbol of a pencil on the cover of the book so people would catch on that it was written with a pencil. He wrote it with a pencil because the pencil had a rubber on the top because he wasn't good at spelling. So he made a lot of spelling mistakes <laughs> and had to correct them. And then I had to correct them again, of course, because it, it's very possible for somebody to spell a word wrong and then spell it wrong again, spell it wrong three times. That's an oxymoron. I don't think so. Anyways, the devil is in the detail, I guess. There we go. When it comes to writing. So detail is important, beginning, a middle, and an end. So let's see what else we need to talk about today. Emmett O'Malley is my guest. The podcast is good to talk. If you like it, do subscribe. It's free to subscribe. And there's always more interesting podcasts coming up. I did mention on my last podcast that I'm putting my shoulders to the wheel for the United Ireland, like Grand O'Malley. Grace O'Malley fought hard against Henry VIII back in, I think she was a brave Irish woman, pirate from Ireland. So anything else before I sign off? On my end? No, I mean, it's, I think one of the things I've thought about a lot, and it's related to like, you know, being on the liberal side of politics is, I don't know, there's a, there's a joke my dad liked about the Irish were the indigenous population in Ireland and then became the cowboys in the United States. And I think trying to remember the way that the Irish were forced under the thumb of uh, colonialism, imperialism. Um, and carrying forth that legacy today and like remembering where we're from informs a lot of the way I see the world in terms of helping people, holding the door open and a sense of community and solidarity. So, um, yeah, I think, I think it's important, especially for those of us who have more immediate ties to our uh, ancestry to kind of bear in mind where they came from and try to, you know, as somebody who, who lives an easier life, it's like knowing that my grandparents really struggled in Western Ireland in the 20th century and that it took them a lot of hard work and luck to get me into a position where I could be on this podcast, you know. It's not very true in it. And what I find myself like, because I was born in County Mayo in Ireland, close to, close to Galway actually, and I find meeting people like yourself, Irish American, second generation or third generation, sometimes people 
people like yourself are more Irish than the Irish ourselves because of it transcending down from great people like your grandparents, of course. And living in Connemara back in the day, it was self-sufficient. You had to fish on the Atlantic Ocean in small boats, yep. of course. The women had to figure out how to knit sweaters, heavy jumpers, to keep the cold and the rain, you know, from the men fishing in the ocean, dealing with bringing in home fish, and sometimes losing maybe a son, a husband, indeed, or a father, indeed, at sea. And I did a podcast at Christmas about dealing with grief. That's an important podcast if people want to get a little yeah. insight. And that was what earned more. And we did talk about crying, how important it is to grieve, and tears. And I did mention on that podcast with earn more that a tradition that happened in Connemara was where when somebody would die in the village or at sea, that the women in the village would create like a whole crying session of tears. And it was called Kinu which means crying. So they cried for the loss of the loved one. And if anyone wants to check yeah. that podcast out, just would earn more. So I'm going to be calling Jimmy Grady soon to sing a song today for us. He's going to sing a song for you, Emmett. He's going to sing a song for me. And he's going to sing a song for Liffey Van Lines, the moving company, because the name of Liffey came from the river in Dublin, the River Liffey. And that name was created by Roseanne Maloney. Rose Maloney, she would be my sister. And she came up with the idea of calling the company Liffey. And then I added to that Liffey do the lifting. Jimmy, hurry up. We want to get you to sing a song. He'll be here in a second. He is only 12. Sorry, he's 12 and a half. That half year means a lot to Jimmy because he wants to grow up big and tall and play basketball, maybe, or be a creative writer of music and songs. I'm going to sign off because we're talking about Connemara today in my native language, my Irish language, because I still speak my own first language, Irish, and my second language, of course, is English. And now I speak better English than the Queen of England, but that's easy, my friends tell me, because she's dead. But the English language is important for world commerce. It's the language of aviation and flying and, and in the world of finance. So Shinsk means that's a story. August Beish, Lela, that means we'll have another story. And your book is published in it. That'll be Shnua which means a new story. And I'm going to say Awalia, which means, Emmet, it means goodbye. And Slon means goodbye and I see you again. So I'm going to say Slon, like that means goodbye. And Slon, good talking to you, Emmet, okay? Good talking to you, John. Thank you very much. On the first day of January 1892, they opened Alice Island and they let the people through. And the first to cross the threshold of that Isle of Hope and Tears was any more from Ireland who is all of fifteen years. Isle of Hope, I love tears, I love freedom, I love fears, but it's not the Isle you left. Behind that isle of hunger, isle of pain, isle you'll never see again. But the isle of home is always on your mind. In a little bag she carried all her past and history. And her dreams for the future in the land of liberty. And courage is the passport when your old world disappears. But there's no future in the past when you're all of 15 years. I love hope, I love tears. I love freedom, I love fears, but it's not the isle you left behind. That isle of hunger, I love pain, isle you'll never see again. But the isle of home is always on your mind. When they close down Alice Island, in 1943, 17 million people had come there for sanctuary. And in springtime, when I came here and I stepped onto its piers, I thought of how it must have been when you're all of 15 years.
tears. I love hope. I love tears. I love freedom. I love fears. But it's not the aisle you left behind that I love hunger. I love pain. I'll you'll never see again. But the Isle of Home is always on your mind. But the Isle of Home is always on your mind. But the Isle.